Coach Show with your host, Sean Green. Welcome to The Coach Show. My name is Sean Green. Our featured guest today is Martin Jacobson. Martin Jacobson is arguably the most successful coach in New York City history. Last week, we looked at a documentary called Coach, which was provided by Satanta. It was an amazing insight into New York City soccer. Today, I'll be traveling to Manhattan to meet with Martin Jacobson. We'll be taking a trip down there, and he'll be discussing what's it like to coach in the inner city and his experiences at working in one of the greatest cities in the world. So follow me on a trip down to Manhattan. Welcome to the Coach Show. We're here with Martin Jacobson, the famous coach from New York City and Martin Luther King High School. Martin, welcome to the Coach Show. Thank you, Sean. This was the longest trip. We probably could have went to Europe by the time it took us to get through the traffic to get here to, for your hometown right here in New York City. What a fantastic city. Uh, best city in the world, Sean. So. This is the greatest city. Just getting to it and leaving it sometimes a little bit of traffic. Now, you've lived here for how many years? Uh, I've been back in New York uh, now 25 years, back home. I call it home. Well, I was born and raised in, uh, in Atlanta, New York. Long Beach, New York. I was born in Brooklyn and uh, raised in uh, Long Island, correct. As a high school coach, you have an unbelievable record, 12 championships in 14 years against 110 different schools in the city here in New York City. Uh, that's just a phenomenal record that you've had. Uh, out of all the famous athletes and all the famous coaches in the Big Apple, uh, you were arguably the most successful and most consistent coach at, in any sport. Uh, so they say. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. So they say. I have had the distinction and the honor of, of winning many championships and uh, a greater number of percentage of wins. Uh, uh, and uh, I've been fortunate. I've been very lucky uh, to have gifted athletes. Uh, and, and possess, you know, some, some uh, records, yeah? uh, uh, winning as coach in uh, history in New York. It's been an honor, and I attribute that to my great kids that played for me. We've just watched a fantastic documentary by Liam McGrath, the Irish filmmaker, who came out here. That was, I believe, four years ago. Uh, it came out correct. It was filmed in 2002, so it was actually six years ago. Uh, no, eight years ago, and then they are in 2003, and then I think they released it in 2004 and 5. So it's been a little bit longer, but it was quite a story, as you can tell. One of the most phenomenal documentaries about soccer at any level that I've watched, it was a great insight into the lives of uh, the kids that you work with and a very special relationship between you and your players. Well, originally produced by Satanta, so they had a, a great inkling to find out uh, uh, what goes on in New York City. And, and one of the things that went on is uh, uh, the struggles of our, some of our young immigrants, and I think they portrayed it uh, in the conflicts of any coach that goes through on the documentary. Personality conflicts, uh, strategic conflicts, uh, uh, competition, uh, all of it's molded into one, and it was quite... Uh, uh, quite a documentary, I believe it was nominated by the, um, I call it the Academy Awards of Ireland, but the, music, the movie and television awards uh, was nominated for their top award uh, back in, I think, 2004 or 5. Right. New York's often referred to as a melting pot, and that, I thought that documentary really was a melting metal pot for soccer. Um, you have players from every different country virtually on this planet. How do you blend these players together? How do you get a winning team out of so many diverse cultures and, and, and characters? Well, the mix of ethnic cultures, the, 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 the diversity is, is tremendous and, and New York City has that in, in general. A third of our students, to a quarter to a third of our, all our students are newly, are immigrants from other countries. Uh, are newly immigrants, even more of them are probably immigrant uh, roots far away. To blend in a team of different uh, style and cultures, as you know, there's a, uh, you know, uh, an Hispanic style of play, there's a, uh, the speed of the West Africans, uh, is, is, is quite a challenge, but if you get them to work together and 
consider each other friends and brotherhoods and bonding. And it's all part of uh, coaching, bringing a team together uh, of different uh, cultural and uh, skill levels. Too. You were quoted as saying that uh, being a part of Martin Luther King soccer is about becoming and getting a better life. Can you explain that? Sure, Sean. Uh, you know, these kids come here pretty much uh, 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 with one thing, a great skill and a great love for the sport we all love. Uh, they have to learn a language that's different, and many of my children do, because they're coming in in the ESL, uh, English as a second language. Uh, they have to, you know, uh, go through an inner city school that's not always the best. Uh, with uh, situations that arise uh, that, that could be a danger to them at times, even though I try to isolate them and protect them. Th they, they, they come here with one thing in mind, as a parent says to me, he is now yours, this is your son. And they tell me these things. Uh, their, their thing about it is I've been so successful uh, with their playing ability, they get noticed so much between myself and of course the clubs they play on, uh, that their better life is usually a great uh, college scholarship or, or at least financial aid to allow them to play at a different level post high school. So the biggest motto and the biggest sign in my office has always been, you know, playing soccer for Martin Luther King is about getting a better life. Well, you've literally produced uh, hundreds of kids have went out to college, great players have went on to play professional soccer, but uh, the most impressive statistic for me was that 80% of your players are graduating and of those about 95% of those players are then going on to college. That's a phenomenal statistic. Uh, something to be proud of, uh, of their, their ability to perform under, under circumstances and learn and of course it is a great thing for me uh, and actually it's actually risen uh, to about 85 to 87% uh, graduation rate. Uh, and the city, as you know, has a, has a, hovers around 55, 60%. And in the country in general, we don't have a great graduation rate. So when they play soccer, their goal is to graduate. And this year, I may have 100% from this team. That's fantastic. It is. Now, what kind of support do you get? Uh, last week on our show, we had uh, we had the University of Connecticut. They're practicing in a $30 million dollar indoor temperature control facility and we looked at your documentary here and it seems to me that you have to work for every inch and every dollar for what you need for your program. How are you funded? Well, uh, the funding part is donations. I get some uh, uh, more recently over the last few years, Nike's been kind enough to donate uh, some product for my kids. Uh, the other thing is for transportation, for meals, for anything we do to travel a little bit to Connecticut, whether it's, it's Westchester County, we have to, I have to like uh, ask some benefactors to come through with some cash and uh, been fortunate enough to do it and a lot of times the cash comes from my pocket. Uh, uh, I can guarantee two to four thousand a year out of my pocket, easy. And Nike have done a super job supporting your program. They, they have, they, they, they've been great, uh, uh, they've been a supporter since uh, for ten, over ten years. Uh, they even uh, supported the entire public school athletic league by giving them uh, hundreds of cleats at one time. They bailed out. Uh, I remember when they were going to close JV programs in the school. Nike came through and, and uh, you know, and, and with a huge grant and kept those open. Uh, we rely on uh, benefactors and great sporting companies to, to assist us in New York City. It's the only way our inner city kids can get help. Let's go back for one moment, Martin, to the documentary we just watched. The two main characters, the two main players in that documentary. Tell us what happened after they finished that one. Well, the two main characters, as you watch that documentary, were uh, uh, you know Ibrahim Fadiga yeah. and, and, and Maurice Johnson. Two quite different characters. One from Jamaica, one from Guinea. The story on Ibrahima was that his father was. Um, his father was, uh, was, was being uh, sought after for, for torture or killing or, or in a Guinea when the president of Guinea died. So he came here on asylum. The story of Maurice Johnson was that he was a young Jamaican boy that, as you know, has a, had a rough upbringing and his mother was unemployed. And it was, it was an interesting piece. And then both of them had this stubbornness to them that was so difficult to overcome not liking each other, yet one had to deal with the other in order to win these games. 
And I always said winning cures all ills, uh, which, uh, as you know, at the end, we won the championship of a very, very strong team we uh, at the time. Both of us nationally ranked at the time in, uh, in the top 20. Couldn't have wrote a, script, a better script for that documentary than the well, way you finished. He sure, Liam sure have picked out the two right uh, characters <laughs> to take uh, take it out of me. Actually, it was about the worst two years of my life, uh, coaching. Uh, the most difficult, not worse, because we won two championships and so nothing could be bad. But the uh, the thing about them was it was definitely showing it was a it was a difficult, uh, stressful uh, period of coaching for me. And As it, many coaches have gone through. I know I'm not the only right. coach that's ever gone through this kind of turmoil and, and conflict. And the thing is, Martin, once you've committed to a project like that, and, and it's not just your commitment, but commitment from cameraman, commitment from funding, you're in it. Whether you win a championship or you come in... You know, I'll never forget the great thing about the movie. They were so excited when we made it to the championship. They flew in four cameramen from Ireland at the time, and I just thought that was great. And they were all hoping we'd win. And uh, and there's another version of that documentary, which is a longer version, that went to a company called Arte, Arte, yeah. I think, in Germany. And it's a five plus two and a half hours. And they filmed that coach, uh, my nemesis at the time. Uh, and they filmed him and uh, in the locker room. And, oh, man, he said some... After he said, <laughs> let's bury the hatchet. So, again, we have duplicity. We have people that look at you on one hand and say another thing. And, and don't we all go through that in life? We do. Uh, let me ask you a question about that. Because one of the controversies that's been uh, a sore point, I would say, with the, the success that you've had... Uh, are with coaches who maybe question the validity of some of the players that you bring to your program. You have players, uh, international players from all over the world. Some come in undocumented, so that without birth certificates. So the real not, there is real no way of telling whether this kid's 23 years of age or 17. Is it just jealousy from other coaches that you've had so much success and don't want to find a reason that you've well, had success? Well, first of all, let's, let's get a couple things straight, okay? Uh, Jealousy and envy is a very powerful. Well, winning, winning brings on jealousy and envy. Uh, I don't care who you are, the president of the United States, as we have, as we know, uh, the mayors, the politicians, whatever you're successful at, they, uh, there's something wrong. You're too successful. You can't be good. And especially as a coach, we go through this all the time. Every coach has. Uh, uh, first of all, as far as that's not true in New York City, they are required to bring documents. So no one comes without. More than likely a passport. Uh, they, what I make them do is present a passport to the Department of Education. I have nothing to do. So that's kind of waned away. You know, it's kind of disappeared. I mean, because there's more and more. It's, it's not true. Uh, these kids come here with documents of some sort. Uh, they are expected to verify documents that go through the Department of Ed's bureaucracy, and then they're placed in the school. They can't walk into my school and say, here, this is, I'm 20, you know, I'm, I'm 16 years old, and just come in. So, uh, years ago, uh, that's where the, 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 the jealousy began. Oh, the kids are too old. The kids are, they go, we're just good. We're just so skilled that you can't be that skilled at 16? You, you, why don't we ask Brazil about that? Well, let's just take a step back. You can't be just good. I mean, you've had a massive, um, massive uh, say in that, Martin. You've you've cared for these kids. You've brought these kids into a program where, you know, I see it all the time. We we we, we want the perfect field as a coach. We want to have 30 balls. We want to have a manicured pitch. We want to have all the things necessary to have a successful program. And if we lose, we blame it because we don't have a good field, or we didn't have the right equipment, or we didn't have the budget. You succeed in spite of everything, and it almost makes other people's championships look hollow. So let me ask you, what do you feel is the hardest part of coaching in, a, in the inner city of New York? Well, we don't have a field to practice on. We have no fields. We have some walls. I have a large gym, teaches a small passing game. I make do what I can. I get kicked off the parks for years. I make believe I have a permit when I don't. Um, you know, I try to find a piece of grass and clean the uh, dog manure up, let's just say. Uh, I do everything I can uh, to just get a little practice in. Could you imagine if I was able to practice set plays? I don't have a goalpost. In the early years, 
It was a garbage can. Two of them. Uh, now, I'll find a field with our goalposts. We will put down cones and say, this is your goal. Uh, it's got a, has it gotten better? No. I, I, not that much. We still have trouble finding it. What I do is I find a field they just built close to school, but they have a game every day on it. So I rush them over to the field so we get some shooting practices in before they start playing with a, on a real goalpost. Uh, we go through a myriad of problems. We go through a myriad of, of situations uh, that is not Yukonish. It's not the women's coach of the $30 million facility. We have none of that. We have passion, we have heart, we have skill. That's what we have. Arguably one of the, if not the most successful high school coach in the country. Why stay in New York City? Why not go to a, another state where they maybe can offer you that? Why stay here? I told you the greatest city in the world. Did I say this is not the greatest city in the world? Uh, I'm here because I love the city and I love my program and I love my kids. Uh, I'll never get kids like this. Uh, uh, I'm not a suburban teacher. I'm not a suburban coach. Uh, I just uh, uh, never really went out there. I, I'm a, I'm a, I call myself a schoolboy coach. I'm a schoolboy coach dealing with schoolboy issues and a large inner city uh, high school. What effect did 9-11 have on you personally living in the city? Well, you know, it's funny. We're sitting here looking at that bridge back there, and yet over there were the towers, and I came here. Now, the story is an interesting story. Sitting over there is a little soccer field not with not much of a grass. It was pretty much dirt. After When 9-11 happened, I took all the kids from the school that were in the ESL, English as a Second Language Program, and I took them to a soccer field. We couldn't get in or out of the city. I'll never forget this. So after school, I took about 200 kids and I threw out a soccer ball. I know it's not 11, but you know, I just throw one ball. And just let them kick it around. Let's get your mind off things. Let's stay here until I get each and every one of your home safe. You know, they closed everything, every bridge, every tunnel, everything was shut off. These kids' parents were worried. Uh, we didn't have, you know, we tried it. You know, back then wasn't a great amount of cell phones, but we had some. So we went ahead and I did that. And right from the end of, as you can see, we're on a pier beautiful pier in near the school. And I sat on the pier and I watched from the field and the pier, I watched the towers burn. And it was quite a, um, quite, quite a, quite a feeling of despair. And yet, knowing that I'd be helping some kids was great. It was, it was good. A fascinating story of a coach and, and uh, the relationships you have and the lives that you've changed by bringing kids in and, and, and being there for them as a guardian and somebody who can and help mentor them and direct them. Um, are there lessons, life lessons in the game of soccer, Martin? Well, uh, of course. John. There's life lessons in every little thing that we do. Uh, life lessons for soccer is, is, to me, I always say, uh, I use the term life lessons. Well, one is learn a passion, keep your passion, keep your focus. And one of the life lessons is your heart. Everything should come from the heart. So I always say that to the kids. And I use the care, which is French for heart, corazon, which is Spanish for heart, and any other language I can find, to bring out the heart. The lessons they learn uh, 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 about success, carries through them throughout life. The lessons they learn about despair or losing a game or, or, or struggles carries with them. So soccer has those elements, uh, both elements, the good, the bad, uh, the, the heartbreaks, the, the, which I've experienced, uh, lost a few championships, a couple to be exact, and all of them has to do with, 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 with in fact, the documentary so me if you see at the end, uh, and I talk about, you know, let's, let, let's pick up the pieces. We lost that championship in that documentary. No, no, in that documentary, we won, you know, I'm sorry. And another one I had lost. And I always talk to them about uh, uh, the struggles that they go through. So it is, it is very much a, 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 a microcosm of the world, life's lessons. And it is more about how you handle defeat rather than how you handle victory and uh, you, you've won probably 95% of the games that you've ever coached but how do you handle defeat it must be foreign to you well first of all yeah I've been fortunate enough to win about 95 do you dismiss it as soon as you walk away from the game or does it hang around for a the only like a bad one that really relative? hits you hard is losing the 
last game. Yes. See, you always have to win the last game to be a champion. That's the way it works. You just have to win that last game. If it's the last game of the season, that's the tournament, you got to win it. Um, so I always, I always use the term, one guy said, a good friend of mine says, you know, he lost, and I lost a couple. You better take away his shoelaces. You know? <laughs> Because I would take the, you know, I was ready to string, and a year I feel bad, you know, a whole year, I, I, it eats me up. But I don't show that to my athletes. I, I show the kids, uh, you lose with grace, that's one thing, if you have to lose. And you'd be proud of what you've accomplished. So, I've been fortunate enough out of the 14 years to win 12 and lose two, but made the championship. Uh, which is not, in itself, being in 14 consecutive games uh, for championships is, is quite an honor. And uh, those times of despair, we just pick up the pieces and uh, work towards the next thing, which is another championship the next year. Let's talk for a moment about the times of despair. Okay. Uh, being a recovering drug addict for 25, 30 years now. Uh, 26 years November. 26 years November. I will have uh, what they call clean and sober. I've been uh, straight, narrow, a drop of alcohol, drugs, anything more than maybe a Tylenol has, 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 has gone into my, uh, my system. Not even anything. Uh, proud of that. Uh, my family's proud of that. And uh, to make that kind of recovery, I don't know, some people say from, from heroin addiction, there's one in must be one in thousands, maybe thousands, make it clean. So uh, I'm unfortunate. What point, because you were coaching at this time too, when you started doing drugs? I was uh, in New Mexico. In New Mexico. Uh, I was the first high school coach in the state of New Mexico, a public high school coach. Uh, it was quite an honor. I started it in 75, 74. I started a club. Uh, then we became the first public high school in 1978 to have a team. There were some private schools. Uh, as I've kind of pioneered it, uh, very proud of what I've done. And then a few years later, five or six years later, I got um, uh, I got addicted. Uh, uh, I got strung out on uh, uh, medication first, and then uh, heroin second. And it was uh, it was a struggle. Uh, it wasn't good. And I was uh, working, teaching, coaching. Yeah. It was a dichotomy of life, you could call it. It was a, the two different lives I was leading. At what point, Martin, would you say that, was there a defining moment where you looked in that mirror, was it a series, or can you tell us what, at what point did you say, I have a problem, I'm going to stop, when did that happen? Uh, numerous things. Every day you look in a mirror. When you're an addict, every day you look in a mirror and say, God, can I not be like that normal person? Can I not be a Sean? Why, why can't I be straight? I don't think you uh, want to be like me. Well, maybe <laughs> not, you know? <laughs> well, no, no. I, are you kidding me? Right. Uh, it would be an honor. So, you know what I'm saying? You look at somebody normal. I remember driving my car and just looking at everybody who's walking by you or driving by you and saying, why, why can't I be normal? Why can't I? Why do I have to have this, uh, this gorilla on my back? I don't even call it a monkey. I call it a gorilla. I would say, why can't I be like them? And you, you pray it, and the next day, you, then you, but you're so physically addicted and mentally addicted and spiritually screwed up, because that's what it is. Okay. And it just came to me one day, uh, I pretty much got run out of town, more or less, uh, we would say, but not totally run out. And uh, I hit such rock bottom, rock bottom, that there was only one way to go. Was up. And I'm talking about penniless, homeless, uh, a daughter who's 12 at the time, 13. And just the key is how bottom is bottom. And I hit my bottom and I was able to, the grace of God, and I told the grace of God, make a move to change my life. And I, and, uh, I did. I, I got up and I said, that's it. And I came back to New York. When, came back home. When I was in your office this afternoon and we saw all those trophies in your office, it, it occurred to me that your biggest victory was not a trophy sitting on the shelf, but maybe that was your biggest victory. Would you say that was true? Well, absolutely. To, to, to be given the second chance in life, to be given a chance to live, uh, you know, drugs, alcohol, block feelings. And now, without them, you, you get feelings. You get, you get, you, you're able to live life to its fullest. And, and that was uh, something, I have to say, uh, you know, 
you know, it's not to say the biggest victim in life. It definitely was an obstacle to overcome. But a beyond belief is addiction. It's, it's, it's a disease. It's, it's devastating. And, and I was very fortunate to, 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 to be able to overcome it. And it doesn't take away from my other victories. Because right. of it, I became a stronger person. And uh, I was blessed with all these championships. Well, I think you are a very... Uh honest man, a very brave man, and to share that uh, along with your championships and your success you've had, to be able to come forward and, 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 and say that outright, that these are the experiences you went through. The beneficiary of that have got, you, have, you must be able to help kids who you identify, and drugs are, are very prevalent in high school now, in college, even junior high. What advice would you give to a young kid? who was dealing with his own demons, whether it be marijuana, alcohol, gambling, what advice would you give to a young soccer player or a young athlete? Well, if, if I'm talking to the world, which I've been fortunate, I think New York City kids who make it to school are less apt to use drugs than the suburban counterparts. Why is that? The culture. Kids are struggling here. You know, Not to say they don't dabble. I've been fortunate on my team. Let me just say that. I have not had a count of that on my team. Once in a while, someone drinks something or it's stupid. But compared to what I know of the other children in this country, the suburban player, I would call it, for lack of a better word. It's an issue. It's a big issue in suburban high schools. Yeah. It's a lot bigger issue because the kids who, and now, now I look at two different things. One, you talk about my soccer kid is not affected. And two, you talk about my, you know, my, my, my overall young student who's in New York City. That's different. Uh, and we don't experience the same things, they have the same problems that exist. They are living for, they're just living in, in projects or housing that are subpar. And they're looking to strive for a better life. They're not looking for that high. And my kids in soccer have been very fortunate to get their high from our sport. Now, in the, in, in the world, but when a kid does come to me with those issues, uh, basically I'll do anything to help them. Whether it's one of the kids I work with in school or whether it's one of my players. And if they did, and or it does, or the word to the world is, is only one path it's leading you to. And it's not the path of righteousness and goodness and, 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 and cleanliness is what you need to be. You need to be clean. You need to be clean and sober to uh, actualize uh, and realize your future and your life. Some of, some of your kids on your team are in uh, group care homes, right? Well, uh, we've had a numerous, numerous kids like uh, Ibrahima yeah. who had to, came here uh, and ended up without a home, uh, which we call them homeless, and they had to go into group homes of foster care agencies and uh, survive some rough, rough times, in fact, some very rough times. And I have uh, two right now uh, in foster care, and one of them is lucky, got into a home that a woman's a foster mother. Sometimes they're not just in foster, foster you know, in group homes, as we call them in New York City. That happens when they become homeless themselves or have no way of, uh, of supporting themselves or anybody who's willing to support them, or the parents aren't here. That does happen. How do you get your players a amount of team? Well, God drops each one of my lap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I work with, uh, I, I think, reputation. Kids apply to my, see, in New York City, you can apply to any school you wish, in, 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 and, and kids can apply, and they can go anywhere they want. It's an open enrollment. So in, between the kids who come from, uh, can come from eighth grade can apply to ninth grade. So a kid can go at any time, uh, apply to be in that building. We, right now, the restructuring of the school has six different schools. We don't need to discuss the, uh, the, the, the Department of Ed. Basically, Martin Luther King has 2,500 kids. Different uh, areas of concentration from theater to art to technology to, uh, you know, a, a partnership with Hunter College. Those schools are there. Kids can apply. Now, a lot of times I work with club coaches who say, I want you to take a look at this kid. So I go out and see him. And I meet them and I meet the family. I say, hey, would you like to come to my school? I, 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 Make sure you graduate, your kid graduates. So we can go and do that. We can do that in eighth to ninth grade. Is that recruiting? I call it attracting. You know? And I thought I'd call it any coach in the city does it. And so these some of these other coaches that have made those kind of remarks, they can do it also. And you know what? They do. You know, my 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 nemesis arch rivals, uh, two schools, uh, absolutely do, you know, the same thing. We, the good schools do it. 
And then you get lucky. You get a kid sent to you, like I said. Uh, look at Mansur and Jai. Just one day, Yukon, the captain, all American, just came and showed up. I mean, I got lucky. So I said, are they dropped by God? They're dropped. And then I tracked a few more from the program. Are you a, re a religious man? I'm a spiritual man. Yeah. I'm a spiritual man. Uh, I'm Jewish uh, by my parents immigrating from, from Lithuania and, and that way, my grandparents. Uh, I believe in freedom of religion. I believe people should be religious and if they choose to be religious. I work with hell a lot of Muslims. Uh, always respect their, their, their practices. I just uh, uh, believe there's a higher spirit, there's a higher God. That's how I got out of trouble with my own demons, as you talked about. And that's how I pray to win championships. So I definitely feel sometimes I'm connected. <laughs> I know people will make fun of me. I, I carry a crystal around. I, I consult with the Marabous of Africa, which are very important spiritual men. Are you superstitious as a guy? Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, <laughs> I find a, a nickel, a penny on the floor. You know, if it's heads up, you pick it up. And you take it and you throw it and make a wish. Uh, every bit of superstition, uh, magic, power, I will recruit, I go through group mass prayers, I will go to a priest in Italy that I met once and I said, hey, do me a favor, I want to show you something, and he'll pray for me, and this is true, this is true. I've done that, you know, when my world travels, I'll say, listen, I'm a soccer coach, give him my card, I say, you got to do me a favor, you see those championships, hey, Ed, Ed, when we get the next year, uh, right now, of course, I'm working on 2011, uh, 2010, I'm sorry, you know, I the United States as a country, are, are, are we missing what you have? It seems that I, uh, we, we have to get back to street yeah, soccer and yeah. getting the kids playing pickup games. You know, coaches seem to me, if they forget the cones, then at the end of practice, they don't know what to do. Do we need to throw the ball down on the ground, a couple of shirts, and just play? Well, the answer is absolutely. <laughs> uh, this is the difference between what we have. We have the contrived, organized, set way. I don't quite coach that way. Uh, I don't even plan so much what to do until I get there that day of practice. And then I say, okay, we're going to do this drill, we're going to do that drill. And I know hundreds of drills in my mind. And the thing is, I'm teaching short passing, I'm teaching creativity. I believe that kids should be able to be creative on the field, not the rigid, uh, stern system that some teams play. I, I, I'm. You know, I, I, I'm different, man. I'm, 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 you know, I'm not, and I'm not cocky. I'm not better. The, their system works also. Your system in college works. I've got a different group that that that, that I feel very positive of the way I coach. Uh, uh, it's a difficult thing. Uh, I can't follow a certain guidelines set up by. Uh, okay, now you have an A license. This is the way you're supposed to coach. Uh, I'm not quite that way. Now, I always felt that I could take a team from New York City and actually give me the right training conditions, give me those kids, I can pick my top 11, and that I can actually uh, beat, beat some of the national team players, U18s, U17s, just give me those conditions, but give me that player that I want to choose. A lot to be said for I mean, without costumes, and I don't mean that. I just mean it can be done. It can be done. The funny thing I, I, I laughed about that day, I got an email from uh, the NSCA, they were doing a symposium on inner city soccer, and they wanted me to attend. Now, I'm looking back 16, 20 years, and what are you talking about? That's all I do is inner city soccer. I run a summer program when we play 6v6 pickup. This is all we do. I've done that for 11 years. Nike started it with me. We still have the summer program. We just play pickup every night, organized pickup. So maybe the secret is to teach the Suburbans a little bit about the inner city soccer. Well, I'm not saying we, we couldn't get our little hind beat by a suburban team. We could. There's some great teams out there. Uh, uh, mix them both together, yeah. and we'd have a hell of a winning program, and maybe that's what U.S. needs. What would you say has been your proudest moment in life, Ron? Well, one of the proudest moments, you know, obviously the birth of my children, birth of my grandchildren, the wonderful woman I live with now, uh, those are great moments. Soccer-wise, there's nothing that beats a championship. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, every time I watch uh, uh, a championship being won, I feel part of that. Whatever sport that's in. Anytime they play, we are the champions. I'm in heaven. But the proudest moment, let's face it, you know, getting my life together, uh, helping others, 
it's a it, it's a composite component. It's not just one defining moment. God graced me with the ability to get clean. God graced me with 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 great teams and great kids and and, 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 and a great reputation to win. Uh, I would say there's no, that's, there's no defining moment, but a defining period. And, and these last 25 years of cleanliness of the defining period, and it's gradual. Everything takes steps. Everything is not done overnight. You know? I've heard a lot of rumors <laughs> that there is going to be a major movie made about your life. Uh, is there any truth to that? Yeah, there's truth to it. There's great truth to it. I'm, I'm being honored uh, with a great group, and I don't want to give away who the group is. It's a, a, a production company and an agency have, uh, 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 you know, are, are, are in negotiations now, a serious negotiations with a, uh, with a contract. Uh, so uh, our contractual uh, things are going out, lawyers are talking, people are talking. So I think when they're ready to announce that they will, and that will be fun because through it, we might be able to change others' lives. Through it, uh, any good movie that, that brings this to you, Sean, you know, if you can invoke change for the good of man, if, they, if, if it's said if you help one other person in life, you've saved the world. And that's what I believe in. And so if something does come up with this, which, again, God, go pray for it, and God willing, it will bring a championship and a movie, uh, it can help people. It can help life. It can help people achieve what they need to achieve. Uh, uh, help others, and your life will get better. If they do make this movie, who would play <laughs> Martin Jacobson? Who would you like to, to play Martin Jacobson in this movie? Well, the good thing... Tom Cruise? Is it? Yeah, shave yeah, his head? Well, first of all, it has to be, an, a, you know, I, I know who I'm dealing with and they've already talked to me about it, but it's all hypothetical. The, the script will be given to about 20 different actors and someone who's 38 and 40, <laughs> tremendously good looking, you know, you know, and, and you know, and of course the, the body has to be yeah, strong, of you, course, know, yeah. I mean, you know, because you know, we can't gain any weight after 60, you know. And a sense of humor. Yeah. Of and you have to joke around. Uh, uh, you never take things to what I call cereal, which is serious, <laughs> and we have to do that. Uh, you know, so whether it's Pitt or Mortensen or uh, whoever it is, uh, let him. You know, make sure he he works out a lot. Make sure he's lifting every day so he can stay, you know, flexed and vexed and all that and stuff. And we'll give him a little team talk. And we'll, we'll 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 definitely do that. So let's hope it's someone real super. Uh, but let's hope it happens because I, it would be fun for me. It would take me to another level. I'd be able to develop a foundation for kids and help more kids in the world. And that's my goal. Uh, uh, I've already started one and it's coming along. It's just, just beginning from an LLC that you knew about. Is there an internet TV set? Uh, well, CoachJake.net right now. Yeah. And I developed also have a scholarship fund. All my kids this year will get a laptop from Jake. That's fantastic. And to go to college. That Every is, single kid will receive a, a laptop to send them off to college. And maybe if any of our viewers are out there watching the show and have been inspired by Jake and his story, maybe they'd like to send a donation to... Well, if they do, they can send it to um, it's the school and care of the Martin Luther King High School Scholarship Fund, uh, soccer fund, sorry, Martin Luther King High School Soccer Scholarship Fund, and they can send it to me at uh, well, 122 Amsterdam Avenue, New York, New York. 10023. The best city. Uh, let me say that again. Uh, <laughs> Martin Luther King High Scholarship Fund. Hey, you listen. If you're generous enough to do that and you want to donate some money, hey, we'll take it. We put it in enough. It's, a, it's, a, it's in a fund and it goes to the kids. When they graduate, only when my kid graduates does he get something. This year I'm going to do, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to do laptops with them. Well, Martin, uh, the whole concept of this show originally was to share experiences with other coaches around the world on, via the internet and on TV and uh, to give them the opportunity to pick over the fence to see how other fellow coaches work and how they affect people's lives and the environments they work in. We're very pleased that you, you, you granted this interview and allow us to do a piece on you on the show here. You're an inspiration not just to the kids and to families, you're an inspiration to coaches all over the world. Wish you nothing but the very best and I'll be the first at the box office to buy the <laughs> ticket when the movie's out. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay.